This section of Joshua describes how Israel took possession of the Promised Land. As we begin, it's important to remember the context of this war. It all goes back to when God brought Abram out of the land of the Chaldeans to the land of Canaan and told him he would inherit that land. However, Abram did not receive the land even though he lived in it for the rest of his life. God delayed giving Abram the land because the sins of the residents of the land were not yet complete. Genesis 15:16. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now that the iniquity of the Amorites had reached the critical level, God gave the command to take possession of the land. This would not be an ordinary war. This was a war in which we learned that the commander of the army of the Lord was in charge. What does this holy war teach us about Yeshua in both his first and second comings? I'm Brenda Cathcart, and this is The Promise of Rest. This war to take the Promised Land was a holy war. It actually began as soon as Israel crossed over the Jordan and entered the land. When they crossed over, they all passed before the Ark of the Covenant. Joshua 4, 12, and 13 tells us that the first Israelites to cross over the Jordan in front of the ark were the men of war. In this holy war, all of the people of the land were to be destroyed as karam, or devoted to the Lord, as Moses instructed more than once while they were on the plains of Moab, waiting to enter the promised land. The Canaanites had inhabited the land since the time that God scattered the nations in judgment at the Tower of Babel. But they had defiled the land with their abominations. The abominations included witchcraft, sorcery, child sacrifice, and various kinds of sexual immorality, especially within the family, but also including homosexuality and sexual acts with animals. God describes all of these acts as abominations, and because of them, the land vomited out the inhabitants. Leviticus 18, 24 and 25. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things, for by all these the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. God pronounced his judgment on these nations. Although God is forbearing, wanting all to repent, he will not put off his judgment indefinitely. Chapters 10 through 12 describe some of the battles Israel fought to take possession of the land. They probably happened over a number of years. God said that he would slowly drive out the Canaanites so the land would not become unpopulated unpopulated and overrun with wild animals. Exodus 23, 29 and 30. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. Chapter 10 describes how Israel took the southern part of the land. Chapter 11 describes how Israel took the northern part of the land. There is little mention of how Israel conquered the middle part and the coastland. Chapter 12 summarizes the conquest of the land, beginning by describing the region conquered, followed by a list of the cities taken east of the Jordan River. Then the chapter repeats this for the region and cities west of the Jordan. The lists of the cities are written as an itemized inventory list with the city listed followed by the quantity 1. At the end of the list, the total number of kings and their cities is tabulated. The list ends with Joshua 12 verse 24 stating, All the kings, 31. The number 31 is written out in words. However, like in English, it can be written as numerals. In the Hebrew language, the numerals are letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The numeral 1 is the first letter of the alphabet, the Aleph. The numerals continue through the tenth letter Yud, representing the number 10. After that, the letters represent multiples of 10, starting with the letter Kaf, representing the number 20. In Hebrew numerals, 31 is the Lamed and the Aleph. 
These are the letters of God's name, L. 19th century theologian E.W. Bullinger comments on the significance of the number 31. The Hebrew expression of this, 31, is Aleph Lamed, L, the name of God, and its signification as a number or factor would be deity. The number of cities in this tabulated list is 31. They are stamped with the divine. This idea is supported by the instructions that all the cities and their inhabitants are devoted to God. So how are these kings and cities marked with the divine? One way that the cities are marked is that God's reputation as a mighty God of war goes before him. Chapter 9 of Joshua began with the kings of the southern part of the Promised Land hearing about what God had done through Joshua in Jericho and Ai. Chapter 10 begins with these same kings hearing about the treaty Israel made with Gibbon. Chapter 11 begins with the kings in the northern region of the land hearing about what God had done to the kings in the south. The southern campaign doesn't begin with the southern kings attacking Israel. Oddly enough, it begins when they attack the city of Gibbon. Joshua 10, 1 through 5. Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibbon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly, because Gibbon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai and all its men were mighty. Therefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, Peram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, that we may attack Gibbon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up, they and all their armies, and camped before Gibbon and made war against it. Another way these cities are marked with the divine is in the similarity between the first battle in the Bible in Genesis 14 and the battle described to begin the conquest of the southern region of the Promised Land. When Gibbon made the covenant with Israel, we learn that the region controlled by Gibbon is actually comprised of four cities, Gibbon, Chephira, Beirut, and Kiriath Yarim. So this battle begins with five kings attacking four cities for a total of nine kings involved. Further, Joshua and Israel are uninvolved at the beginning of the battle. In comparison, in the first battle in the Bible, four kings from the Babylonian region attack five cities in the Valley of Siddim for a total of nine kings. In this battle, Abram is uninvolved until he learns that his nephew Lot was among the captives. Abram pursues the attacking kings and rescues Lot and the other captives. In this situation with Gibbon and the southern kings, Gibbon sends a messenger to Joshua to come rescue them. Joshua 10.6 And the men of Gibbon sent to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly, save us, and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. The phrase translated as, do not forsake your servants, is literally, let not thy hand cease. Joshua 8.18 relates that when Joshua led the battle against Ai, he took his spear and stretched out his hand over the city. The word save is the Hebrew word yasha, number 3467, meaning to open, free, be, or make safe, to help, rescue, or save. Joshua's name comes from this word Yasha. His name, number 3091, means the salvation of Yah. So the Gibeonites sent to the salvation of Yah to come, extend his hand over their enemies, and save them. This is actually the second time that Joshua saved the Gibeonites. The first time was when Joshua delivered them from being killed by the Israelites. 
The comparison between these battles in Genesis and Joshua continues. In Genesis, Abram pursued and attacked the enemy forces at night. Genesis 14, 15. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. Joshua, assured by God that the five kings would be delivered into his hand, traveled through the night and caught the kings by surprise. Joshua 10, 9 and 10. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibbon, chased them along the road that goes to Bet Horon, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. He came upon them suddenly. They were not expecting anyone to come to Gibbon's aid. When Yeshua returns, he will come suddenly and unexpectedly also. Going back to the number of combatants in these battles, the number nine in the Bible represents completion and fulfillment of judgment. Nine is frequently paired with one more to make a total of ten. In Egypt, there were nine plagues, followed by the tenth plague, which provided both final judgment on Egypt and redemption for Israel. Hosea, the last king of the northern kingdom of Israel, reigned nine years. Israel was taken into captivity in the tenth year. In these battles in Genesis and Joshua, nine kings battled. But the battle was won when Abram and Joshua, the tenth participants, entered the fight. On the positive side of completion or fulfillment, Paul lists nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 and nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. As we continue examining the battle at Gibbon, we see that Joshua ascended from Gilgal to engage in the battle. Joshua 10, 7. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. When the Lord and Joshua routed the five kings in battle, the kings descended to Bet Haran, Joshua 10, 11. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Bet Haran that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. Metaphorically, ascending refers to entering into God's presence, such as when the smoke of the offerings ascends to God. Descending refers to leaving God's presence, such as when Judah descended from his brothers after the fiasco of selling Joseph into slavery. At the same time, Joseph descended into Egypt. However, with Joseph, God assured him that he would go with him. The five kings in Joshua not only descended, but they also hid in caves. The name Beit Horan, number 1032, means house of hollowness or caves. As the kings fled before Israel, God cast down large hailstones on them with more soldiers dying from the hailstones than from the battle. This demonstrates that the battle was really won by the Lord. So far, we haven't made any connection with this battle to Yeshua's first coming. Yeshua didn't engage in any battles, at least not physically. However, his first coming can be compared to Israel taking possession of the promised land. Like Israel, he crossed over into the land through baptism in the Jordan River. He traveled throughout Israel, preaching the good news that the kingdom of heaven was near. He sent out 70 disciples to prepare the way for his visitation, instructing them to make peace with those cities that received them, like Joshua made peace with the city of Gibbon. In preparation for his death at Passover, Yeshua crossed over the Jordan River twice. He visited Jericho immediately before ascending to Jerusalem to offer himself as a Passover sacrifice. This takes us to probably the single most miraculous event in the Bible, which, according to any law of physics, is totally impossible. The sun stood still. We'll look at this event in Young's literal translation so we can carefully examine what the Bible says about this event. Joshua 10, 12-14 
Then speaketh Joshua to Jehovah in the day of Jehovah's giving up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he saith before the eyes of Israel, Sun in Gibbon stand still, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun standeth still, and the moon hath stood, till the nation taketh vengeance on its enemies. Is it not written on the book of the upright? And the sun standeth in the midst of the heavens, and hath not hasted to go in, as a perfect day. And there hath not been like that day before it or after it, for Jehovah's hearkening to the voice of a man, for Jehovah is fighting for Israel. The first thing to notice is that the last half of verse 12 and the first half of verse 13 are written in poetic form. The prophet Habakkuk refers to this event when he extols the power of God in a prayer song. Habakkuk 3.11 Sun, moon hath stood a habitation. At the light thine arrows go on. At the brightness the glittering of thy spear. Habakkuk's imagery suggests that the light of the sun and moon from their dwelling place in the heavens is like the arrows and spear of God. It is as if Joshua had asked God to shine his light over Gibbon until God's vengeance was complete, similar to the Gibeonites asking Joshua to extend his hand to save them from their enemies. Another interesting word that Joshua used was the word translated as stand still in verse 12. This is the Hebrew word daman, number 1826, meaning to be silent, by implication to be astonished, to stop or cease. So Joshua commanded the son to be silent, be astonished, or to stop. The response in verse 13 pairs the son with the same word daman, but the moon is paired with the verb stood. The word stood is a mod, number 5975, meaning to stand, abide, or cease. We can understand Joshua as commanding the son to be silent in astonishment at the vengeance of God. Another word of interest is the word translated as perfect in this literal translation. It is the Hebrew word tamim, number 8549, meaning entire, whole, without blemish, or perfect. It is most often translated as perfect, whole, or without blemish. For example, the offerings brought before the Lord had to be tamim, perfect, and without blemish. So this day was a whole, perfect, or a complete day. Taken with the significance of the number nine in this account, it points to the complete and perfect judgment of God on the Canaanites in the land. This event is recorded in the book of the upright. The word upright is number 3477 Yashar, means straight, just, righteous, or upright. In the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, Moses referred to Israel as Yeshurun, meaning the upright one from the same Hebrew word. This is the book of the upright acts of Israel. As amazing as this event was, the greater miracle is recorded in verse 14. There was no day like this day, not because the sun stood still, but that Yehovah hearkened to the voice of a man. The word hearkened, number 8085, is the word shema, meaning to hear intelligently or to hear and obey. Yahovah obeyed the voice of Joshua because the Lord fought for Israel. The Gospel of John says that God has listened to the voice of Yeshua to execute judgment. John 5, 25 to 27. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Returning to the conquest of the land, Joshua trapped the five kings in the caves where they had hidden until the remainder of the armed forces were destroyed. Joshua brought the kings out of the caves, pronounced judgment on them, killed them, hung them on a tree until sundown, and then returned them to the cave. 
the caves became burial caves. In this sense, the kings took refuge in the grave, were resurrected to face judgment, and returned to death. Joshua 10, 26 and 27. And afterward, Joshua struck them and killed them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging on the trees until evening. So it was at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded, and they took them down from the trees, cast them into the cave where they had been hidden, and laid large stones against the cave's mouth, which remain until this very day. As this perfect day ended, judgment was complete, and Joshua returned to the Israeli encampment at Gilgal. Joshua 10, 42 and 43. All these kings in their land Joshua took at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. This judgment on the Canaanite kings foreshadows the final judgment when everyone will stand before God to give an account of their lives. Those whose names are written in the book of life will have eternal life, but those who worship the beast will be cast into the lake of fire and eternal death. Revelation 20, 13 through 15. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. After an unspecified period of time, the kings in the northern part of the land heard about how Joshua, under the direction of the Lord, had subdued the southern region of the promised land. King Yabin of Hatzor gathered an even larger coalition of kings to fight against Israel. Joshua led the battles against these kings and defeated them. Joshua 11:12. So all the cities of those kings and all their kings Joshua took and struck with the edge of the sword. He utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Joshua was victorious over all the kings who rose against him to fight against Israel. The Bible records that after these battles, the land had rest from war. Joshua 11:23. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had said to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. Then the land rested from war. This was a holy war fought to cleanse the promised land from the defilement caused by the inhabitants of the land. Yeshua fought a similar battle as he came preaching repentance to the Jewish people in the promised land. He magnified God's name in the eyes of both the Jewish people and the Romans living in the land. When Yeshua returns, he will fight another battle to cleanse the land which was defiled by the iniquities perpetrated in it. It will be a perfect day, a day of the fulfillment of God's divine justice, and then the land will have rest from war. I'm Brenda Cathcart for Moed Ministries International. Shalom and be blessed.